Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, have you ever wondered what happens with extra eager developers that poke their nose into everything, who are always provoke and question the management, and who always ask questions nobody else dares to ask, but are not doing it out of malice. They are sincerely interested in the well-being of the company. Apparently, a path often taken uh, by those kind of developers is a path that leads to some sort of management positions. So, I'm Mislav. Uh, I'm a developer team lead, gun for hire. I'm professionally in the IT industry for about 10 years. During that period, I've switched several companies and in those companies, companies switched even more teams. I came here to talk about team leadership, a position I was proud to have in several of those teams. And I also came here to admit that most of the time I was lost and most of the time I had no idea what I was doing. I'm a person that always tries to face my fears, so every time I get a chance to do something like that, I jump in on that. Such was this chance, for instance, speaking at this conference in front of all of you. Uh, just one more thing uh, I know nothing about in the long line of me doing just the shruggy. So, with zero formal training, relying on my intuition and various pieces of advices from I picked up uh, here and there from people who are way smarter than me, I've more or less successfully led my teams to their goals. On that path, I've learned tremendously, improved myself and hopefully my teams. I would like to share with you today uh, what I learned and some advices someone told me before I embarked on this path. First, I want to mention the Peter Principle that states that people in structures, and this is intended like general corporate structures, not just our own developer's path. People in, in structures tend to rise to the level of incompetence. So in other words, every time you get a major promotion, you're actually on the verge of barely being able to do your job. Up till now, you're an expert in your field, and now you will probably wonder, am I ready for this? And maybe you are, maybe you're not, but if someone else thinks you can do it and you have decency to look into your own self and your skills, I just say, do it. What's the worst thing that can happen? You will never feel 100% certain that you will be able to handle this. And if you did, it wouldn't be on the edge. It wouldn't be a new challenge for you, right? Being a lead is not in any form or way just an upgraded version of the job you did before. It's almost entirely a new job. I think that in our own path, the developer's path, this is the biggest jump in the mindset people can uh, actually experience through their careers. You're still within the same business domain, but outside of your safe zone. You need to take care of new roles, a, lot, a bunch of them you're not prepared of. First one is a familiar one, but now it's got a twist. I'll start this one with a story. I got hired by uh, this company to lead a small team of developers, about six. And the original plan that I struck with the management was I'll do 20% team management stuff. It was a small team, so it made sense. And 80% on the development tasks. It sounded dreamy. It sounded the perfect intro to stuff like that, to the team uh, management stuff. And first month and a half, I wrote four lines of code. So, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing, but when you're getting yourself into, be aware of the deal you made and be aware about what's really going to happen. The bigger the team, the bigger the project, less time you're going to spend actually writing the code, and that's okay, because you need to realize that you're not a code monkey anymore. Now you're the architect, the decision maker, the organizer, and more than everything, the reviewer. You're placed in this position to produce more code than ever, just not anymore by yourself. So if you're not producing the code, who is? Which leads us 
to hiring. For the first interview, uh, I sat in as, uh, as the guy actually conducting the interview. I explicitly asked that I want to be included in that. And soon my wish was granted. I don't know who sweated more, the developer looking for a job or me. And when I'm nervous, I drink a lot of water, like right now. So at the beginning of the interview, uh, my colleague uh, from HR asked the candidate, you know, how it goes, would you like something to drink? And I just wanted to shout, please give me a bucket and bring it here. I was worrying not to look like a total tool, like I'm going to uh, look like a fool in front of this person. I probably spent more, times, more time thinking how I look than actually listening to the candidate. In my head it was a mess. But after a, a while, unfortunately a few, a few of those interviews, I sl slowly realized that I don't need to sound like the smartest person in the room, the candidate does. So why not help them with that? I became the good cop. I started nodding along to their explanations. I started saying stupid jokes to ease them. Uh, I started saying me too to their stupid stories. Uh, and I tried to make this formal talk as pleasant and as informal as I could. By reducing the pressure on the candidate, I got a more honest face from them. And uh, their way of thinking, because I get to meet the person and not just the developer mindset. I have one golden rule uh, that I started to employ like four years ago, and that is don't be an ass. Tech can be taught, but I can't teach you what kind of person you are. Which, in an interview, uh, setting this is sometimes a problem for me because I'm not very good at reading people. My social skills are subpar, so to speak. And when it comes to some human interactions, sometimes I feel like a deer in headlights. Interviewing for me, and I believe for most of the people, it just doesn't come naturally. But it's a skill that improves with practice. But this is a trial and error in production, and... We are, we are developers, we know what trial and error in production means. We all did it at some point in our lives and it's extremely scary, but sometimes you just have to do it. But even with trial and error in productions, you can minimize, uh, you can try and minimize uh, the negative effects of that. So I spent a lot of time preparing for the interview. I started writing questions I'm going to ask, but not just the questions, I started to slowly anticipate the answers and from those answers create new questions, has whole uh, trees of possible pathways I'm going to take the candidate through to get uh, the, all the answers I need from them. All this to have smooth back and forward with the candidate. You assume that the candidate took some time to prepare and it's only fair for you to do the same. So. Uh, so you hire someone, they are great, and until they are not. This is the other side of the coin, and uh, this is probably a slide uh, not a lot of people want to talk about. And because that's also because probably it's the hardest thing to do. Luckily, I only had to do it once. Uh, I don't even know if there's a way to do it completely gently. Just... Make sure this is a last result so solution. Make sure you've exhausted all options before that. Give your team members regular reviews, but don't stick to the good, good stuff. Give them negative reviews, because people sometimes come from other teams, just have their way of thinking that is misaligned with your team. Maybe they want to change, they ju just don't know they should change. Whatever you do, just make sure you fire a few warning shots before you pull the trigger. Of course, sometimes this, in a, in, it's, you can't avoid it, so after you've done it, the first thing you have to do is explain to the rest of the team why this happened. Don't wait too long, because this is a major thing. 
especially in a small thing, is in a small team. Such info needs to come from you, and let's face it, it, it can only get worse if it comes from the other side. So, back to the happy topics. So, you hired some people, hopefully fired none. Uh, most probably got a few people assigned to your team. And now you can start actually delegating the work. When I first started being a lead, I did one, ex one thing regarding delegation extremely wrong. I'm a developer still, and I wanted to do all the fun, new stuff myself. And it came from a place where I was selfish, but also not trustworthy enough to my team members. Of course, that backfired really fast. Uh, I became the bottleneck of the project. I had people in my team who could have taken on this task, but it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I wanted to take the hardest tasks to not to bother my team, but with taking the biggest task, I bothered my team by blocking them from doing anything else. I should have started, and luckily I did, started to listen to my teammates uh, and remember that, ask them what they want to work on, accommodate them if you can, and give them a clear, clear explanation if you can't accommodate their wishes what they work on on the project. Get to know them and get to know their strengths and weaknesses, but work on your sixth sense and push them in direction maybe they don't self even know they want to go. Try to read your team's inner dynamics. We are all humans. Some people just work better with others and not with some others. And that you need to be aware of that. Don't push two people together that clearly have different states of mind. In extreme situations, you're the one whose only work is triage. No time for discussions, you need to know on the spot who can and will deliver a solution. Don't ping them non-stop, don't throw new logs to this heaping trash pile that is happening right now. Let your team do what they do best, and that is solve problems. Again, this is uh, something that is, creates a really weird feeling for me. I'm in control of this whole situation, but I don't directly do anything tangible. Success of my job is solely based on the success of others, and that is really scary. And sometimes I find myself thinking, people are the worst, which is a horrible notion if you manage people, but sometimes it happens. For instance, you have a breach in your production database, a uh, hacker demanding some ransom, and the dev who was just working on the security features for that database yesterday decided that it's time for their haircut. And they just leave. It's really hard to love the whole human mankind as a whole at that moment. But with a good team, a team you trust, another thought comes to mind that people are the best. People love being heroes. People love to shine, but you need to make that happen for them. You need to be the Alfred to their Batmans. You need to be Jarvis to their Ironmans. You need to clear the road in front of them and open the doors for your team and trust them. Trust is in large part built through communication. Don't be a team, a team lead that sits in his glass office and just issues, tickets, without ever speaking to anyone. Make sure you have regular one-on-ones. You can have them scheduled or not. Uh, in my experience, schedule works better, because if you don't schedule something, it's probably not going to happen, and you, have, give, you give chance to your team members to prepare for this chat. They know, like every Wednesday, they're going to talk to you, maybe throughout the week they make bullet points for them, so they can actually have a conversation. 
just don't keep it running too long. If you have nothing to talk about, sure. Five minutes, hi, hi, how it's going, that's it. In those talks, you want to also earn your team members' trust. So be prepared to open yourself. These talks work two ways. Be honest there and let your guard down and show your true face. After all, this is what you are hoping to get from your team. With group meetings, uh, make sure you know who should be actually in a meeting and who shouldn't. Some time ago, I was a regular developer in this uh, remote team. And there was a, this group meeting of around 10 people. And all of a sudden, only two devs started to talk that something is only related to them. I had my wireless headphones on and uh, I just subtly turned off the camera and uh, went to make a cup of tea. I'm, I'm in my home office, so why not? I can still hear them, they're still going on and on. I went to fold the laundry. I put a new, uh, some new laundry in the washing machine. Still hear them? I'm still in the meeting, so to speak. So I did the dishes. I cleaned some leftovers from the fridge. I was looking around the apartment because it's home office, you always have something to do. Uh, and you want to spend your free time doing that. <laughs> uh, and I was just about to reach for the vacuum when people finally started to say goodbye and that was it. So make sure you know who should be and who shouldn't be in a meeting. And as a general rule of thumb, if in a meeting, like two or three people start to just talk on something that is only related to them, you as a team lead and the one who is actually facilitating this meeting, you should stop that. And you should say, okay, you can stick around five minutes later or, or just schedule some other time and work, work it on your own. Other people don't need to be included in this. Another extra tip uh, that I find quite useful is like after this group meetings, create like a too long did not read documents with some basic uh, points, what was actually being discussed and have this document also contain like a list of action items. If you have a meeting that nothing leads from it, it was probably wasted time. With this too long did not read documents of sorts, you are creating a paper trail, but not just for your team, for your team members who weren't able to attend the meeting, but also for the rest of the company. You're giving others to chance to actually know what's happening with the team and the product, the project you're working on. I have a nice bonus suggestion here also. I actually picked that up from a client uh, in the past year. Uh, it's to start each group meeting with a totally random question, like a check-in question. It can span from which animal describes you today to what's the weirdest thing in your refrigerator right now. It's an icebreaker. It's extremely important uh, for this uh, icebreakers in uh, remote teams because you don't have people chatting before they enter the room. They just supposed to go like instantly into business mode. It's, that doesn't happen in the human brain that easily. And with this stupid question, you get instant team cohesion and you're ready to start working on the real task. As a good leader, you need to recognize and magnify your accomplishments, you know, magnify your team members' accomplishments. Praises and recommendations are a powerful tool that you can use to boost teams' morale, morale and engagement. Celebrate progress, but don't go crazy and issue silly participation trophies. Use the power of compliment to actually compliment something tangible. People know when they did actually something that is worth uh, praising and not when they just showed up for work. Don't force it, it will start sounding insincere. But also don't focus only on the big things because people are also always working in the background on a lot of things that 
are not really that much user facing or yeah not really that that visible so you need to know what your team members are doing and the complexity of their tasks and praise them accordingly if they did a good good job small uh, wins that move the product forward are the thing you're looking for here There are many more roles uh, that I haven't touched today, but this is a 25 minute talk. So, uh, and I'm nervous, so I know I'm gonna speed through it. So I would like just for you to take home, uh, if nothing else, then my final piece of advice. Learn and continue learning. As with previous developer role, you're probably good at this if you got this far. So just move those learning skills that you learned either a new framework, new language, and move them into learning uh, management skills and people skills. Trust is something that I can't talk uh, enough. This is the hard part of uh, human interaction. The same way you need to trust people, people need to trust you, and this takes time. It won't happen overnight, and it's very difficult to move forward in those relationships, and extremely easy to move backwards. Make sure that often you're the one who will protect your team, either from higher forces or from... Uh, clients who are very violent and angry. Just make sure you're doing a good job of feeling your team safe. And this is also one way you're going to earn your team's trust. So continue asking those questions people don't want to ask and don't dare to ask. Don't avoid hard conversations and discussions. Be open about them with the team, if you can. Democratize decision-making. You have a group of experts and you're probably on your team because they're each expert in their own field. So gather their knowledge and use it. Make sure that everybody feels included. But with, as with everything, don't try to go overboard with it. Know when to end. I miss love, and this was on the edge of leadership. Thank you, Miss Love. I have the first question because I have the microphone. Uh, <laughs> can you recommend uh, some books that um, you can, you read? Probably, I think five dysfunctions of a team was one of them. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, sorry to the mic. Uh, yeah, my mind is racing. Uh, I know. Uh, I didn't. I must admit, I didn't focus uh, so much on the books, but on the talks, mm -hmm. uh, and really a lot of art, medium articles because they're easily digestible. Yeah, there's the the world is happening there. On the, on yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I agree. But this general leadership advice is they're not just for developer teams. There, a lot of these uh, advices are general for each and for every corporate structure, however small or big it is. is. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Um, so do you use friendly approach to managing teams or is it strictly business? Uh, yeah. Uh, I try to be as friendly as possible because I'm just that kind of guy. Uh, I don't like to being like keeping a strict, uh, Keep it strictly professional. I mean, there is, a, of course, separation, but I don't mind going uh, uh, to have a beer with my team members and talk about what they're working on and stuff like that, uh, even in, like, serious discussion. Why not? Do you think there is some kind of a limit where uh, there should uh, the professional side should be enforced? And, uh, yeah, yeah, like of that. course, there's a limit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, this is you, you kind of guessing where the where the that person is. 
and that limit is always different with each person also yeah. also some trust and confidence between yeah yeah of course you yeah. can just like uh, first day of work let's go grab a beer you you, you can't do that of course yeah maybe that's a good start yeah uh, <laughs> maybe, I, trust me uh, you can get an into experience where people actually don't drink and of course yeah, then, uh, then you're, you they be, actually yeah. can be insulted by you suggesting they go take a drink yeah so very careful with that stuff too cautious yeah yeah uh, so how do you decide who chooses the important tools um, like libraries continuous integration tools issue trackers okay yeah uh, okay uh, in larger companies that is often uh, decide from uh, up above but in uh, a lot of this small companies like startups and uh, either your team that's actually deciding on something new I tend to this last part I was talking about democratize this I can I say like everybody can give a suggestion but you can just say we're gonna use I don't know uh, GitLab CI you need to say why and you need to get other people on board, but, and then we can have like a discussion somewhere, uh, regarding this. Just the important thing is then don't let th those discussions turn into days for most of these kinds of decisions, because it's just tooling. So it's not the product you are creating. So in, in one. Yeah, 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 at People one can point, talk, but there should yeah. be a decision. Yeah, at one point, the... uh, I had these experiences like it went on and on, and after two or three days, you as a team lead, you're probably going to do like the cut, but don't do like we're going to do this because I said we're going to do this because this was actually the best defended proposition and best explained one. Uh, yeah, so stick with the decision your team made. That is the closest thing to actually everybody wants to do, but often you're going to have like one person going totally in complete direction. Yeah, <laughs> but you need to know when to end these discussions. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have any tips for pre-screening interview candidates? Like, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I try to spend uh, quite a lot of time. Uh, Picking, uh, <laughs> googling people actually, and sometimes that's extremely difficult because, especially when I tried to one hire a, a security guy, <laughs> 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 there was nothing or no social media, no social media presence whatsoever, uh, on nothing either on GitHub, GitLab. Uh, but yeah, usually people have something because they're still trying to so to speak, sell themselves, uh, either on LinkedIn and I just, yeah, try to Google as much as I can, uh, regarding this, uh, pre-screen, uh, uh, yeah, it depends on the position probably, but I try to get, uh, in a call with them as soon as possible. Uh, just to get like maybe even the first call would be not that much technical just to get like this where they are and uh, their level of are their junior junior senior or mid their level of experience yeah I mean I the thing is if you are googling for someone uh, and not finding anything don't take it as a negative thing it's still uh, people are sometimes very private and it's okay yeah. Uh, yeah, and probably a last question. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, what do you think that contributes significantly to the growth from a developer to a more managerial leadership role? And growth is not necessarily the right term. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, what probably is like what pushes you down that path? Uh, what leads you? I don't know. Uh, uh, what can help you? Eh? Yeah, uh, you want you want to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's not just that you want to do something like this, but you kind of feel like you have a natural inclination uh, towards this. And I'm not saying that this uh, down the management path is the only way, 
there are great developers who go to be principal engineers and being the best technical persons ever. And they're aware that their human skills are not either that good or just they don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Just you need to be aware and you need... Okay, for me, it initially didn't start uh, I would, that I was aware of. I was going down that path. What Once I was aware that I want to do this, I actually started to getting like involved. If I saw a meeting I was in that was being complete chaos, I just stepped up and tried to organize that meeting. If you see something that isn't some part of your whole pro uh, process of the de as a development team isn't working and nobody's doing nothing to improve it, well, do it. Then you took the initiative. Yeah, take yeah. the initiative. I mean, maybe nobody will notice, but maybe some will notice. If nothing else, you will improve the process and that's it. So thank you very much for your talk, for the questions. In case uh, you want to... Uh...